Hello everyone and uh, you're welcome to our webinar. Uh, one step forward and three steps back. We're addressing gender violence in 2021. Uh, we're very happy to receive you or to be connecting with you from all over the world. Um, thank you to everyone who is greeting from everywhere. Uh, thank you for all your greetings. And we're about to begin. Uh, Robin, over to you. Sure, thank you so much. Yes. Um, patience, before I go, I'm wondering if you'd like to introduce yourself and, um, and then I will introduce myself okay. and go on. Sure. Okay. So uh, I'm patient Agwinjan Gomwe from Cameroon from the Research and Advocacy for Gender Justice. I'm speaking from Cameroon and I'll be your co-moderator alongside Robin. Thank you. Thank you, Patience. Mm -hmm. um, and I am Robin Neustader. I am an assistant professor of education at St. Francis Xavier University and program teaching staff at the Cody International Institute, where I teach and research adult education, women's peace building, leadership, and community development. I'd like to begin by doing a land acknowledgement. Cody International Institute and I are located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which the Mi'kmaq and Wasilostalik or Maliseet peoples first signed with the British crown in 1725. The term unceded means the land was not given up voluntarily. It was taken through a process of settler colonialism that indigenous people have resisted and continue to resist. This is important to acknowledge, especially as we mark the International Day of Violence Against Women and Girls and the start of the 16 days of activism, which patients will talk about soon. And while we recognize the marginalization and violence perpetrated against Indigenous women, girls and two-spirited peoples here in Canada and around the world, we must also take note of their strength and resilience as they have worked and continue to work to create a more peaceful world, particularly, particularly leading the way to care for, defend and protect our children, women, men, communities and environments. Around the world, people experience violence based on their gender identity, gender expression or perceived gender. This is gender-based violence. According to the UN Women, globally, one in three females over the age of 15 has experienced intimate partner violence or non-intimate partner violence, or both, at least once in their lives. Fewer than 40% of women who experience violence seek help, and the majority turn to family and friends for support. Fewer than 10% turn to the police. Women and girls in violent conflict in war zones often have these wars fought directly on their bodies while they are raped, beaten, and traumatized. With the COVID-19 pandemic came lockdowns, economic insecurity, school closures, and reduction in social services and support, and increases in early child marriages. And we see this, this shadow pandemic, an increase in gender-based violence around the world affecting girls and women. At the same time, we see governments clawing back hard-earned rights for women to determine what happens to their bodies and accessible, legal, and safe abortions. In this reality and more, this webinar came together, recognizing that while strides in changing norms, cultures, and laws to support and protect women and girls have happened, we feel that for each step forward, it can feel like we are pushed three steps back. While gender-based well, gender violence is really a global reality, so are the thousands of actions and interventions happening in communities to support survivors of gender-based violence and their families. These thousands of actions are acts of justice, social justice, caring, and peace building for girls, women, their families, and societies. Patience, I hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Robin. Yeah, uh, as Robin mentioned, uh, the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women is often celebrated through the 16 days of global action 
where different groups of people across different nations uh, carry out one activity or the other in honor of women, uh, uh, in honor of women and men who have been victim, victimized by violence in one way or the other. This year's theme is Orange the World, Ending Violence Against Women. And more of the focus of this year is around the shadow pandemic and gender-based violence. So in this uh, session, we're going to find out from our speakers how they've been handling gender-based violence in their different corners with their different actions, big and small, and we'll be learning from one another and, and sharing. So with this, uh, I'll move straight to introduce our first panelist. Oh, patience, just a minute. Can I just explain a little bit how the webinar is going to happen? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Um, so for today's webinar, webinar, we'll continue with our three distinguished uh, panelists who will each speak to their work on yeah. addressing gender-based violence in their communities. Also here today, I'm just so, so pleased with everybody who has joined us today. We are a diverse global group interested and concerned with the issue and reality of gender-based violence. And our diversity can bring with it diverse perspectives. This is an opportunity to listen and learn with one another. Remember that we can only speak from our own experiences and that our experiences are our own and not universal. Following the um, speakers, we'll have a question and answer period with which will begin with two questions posed to all speakers. This will be followed by an open time of questions from the audience. Um, please post your questions in the Q&A. And then we will close with a final question to all the speakers. So thank you. Okay, patience. Thanks for that. Okay, thank you, uh, Robin. I almost skipped that. Uh, it was important to get the webinar process. So as Robin mentioned, we are having three distinguished panelists with us. I'll be introducing our first panelist, who is Carla Stevenson. Uh, Carla, I really hope I pronounce it well. <laughs> Carla Stevenson is a Mi'kmaq woman from the punk bank Banquet First Nation, which is located about 15 kilometers outside Antigonish. Carla is a mother of three amazing daughters, Jada, who is 22, Gwendolyn, 17, and Blanke Alexi, who is four years old. These three are a driving force behind the work that Carla does to help support and educate on sexual violence and gender being violence against indigenous women and girls. Carla is the project coordinator of the Circle of Support and Change Project and the former community facilitator of the Responding to and Prevention of Sexual Violence Project in Banquet, Ban Banteket. And she's an alumni uh, to the indigenous women in Community Leadership Program of the Cody Institute and the building on local and indigenous knowledge for community resilience program in 2017. Uh, Carla has spent over six years in community lead programs, uh, leading how to better support victims and survivors of uh, sexual violence and gender-based violence while practicing self-care and traditional wellness in her First Nation community of Banquet, Banquet Mi'kmaq Nation. So here's a quote from Carla. Carla, you correct me with the pronunciation. So Carla says that when we better understand how to respond to someone else's trauma, we build ourselves up to show empathy, kindness, and love for one another. So Carla, you are welcome to this session and we would like to hear from you what you have to say. Thank you Over so much you, for that Carla. introduction and that was really great. Um, yes, Buckingham isn't the easiest to pronounce. So I thank you for that. Um, I'd like to thank Robin also for inviting me to come speak today amongst all of you. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick um check for my agenda i'm just going to do a background on the circle of support and change project um some highlights from the circle and support change project um what's next 
and our indigenous approach uh, to knowledge and um, how we're planning to transfer that into the project itself. Um, so thank you all for having me today. This is um, amazing how many people are actually online and um, connected to this call. We're calling from actually my car, Nancy Ganesh. Um, I'm on the road today, so I'm just gonna be very hopeful that the internet cooperates and just thankful for that introduction. Um, uh, so the background to the Circle of Support and Change project is a project of the Antigonish Women's Resource Center, Sexual Assault Services Association, uh, working in partnership with three distinctive rural underserved communities uh, to help develop community-led and community-based responses for preventing and responding gender-based violence and sexual violence. Uh, it is rooted in the belief that the knowledge as well as the most appropriate and effective approaches to addressing gender-based violence and promoting healthy relationships held within local communities. It's built upon learning from community-led and community-based projects like the Buckingham Mi'kmaq Nation Not model, a model that has been replicated in other indigenous communities. The Respondent to and Prevention of Sexual Violence Project, which was implicated in 2015 to 2017, which I was a community facilitator for that in our community. So I just helped um, coordinate most of the events along uh, with a coworker. Uh, they actually developed a toolkit, which is available on the AWRC uh, website. You can access the toolkit and download it as a PDF. Um, so the new project that I'm on now is actually developed from the first project that I was on as a service as a community facilitator. Uh, so the Circle of Support and Change project uses strength-based uh, trauma-informed approaches to the center to center the voices of survivors of gender-based violence in circles of support that include their families, community members, educators, service providers, in facilitated circles of support. Participants identify and develop community-led responses to gender-based violence, along with culturally and community relevant and wellness healing and practices. Some of the highlights through our project, which was, um, it's in its second year now, the Circle of Support and Change. Um, just the impact from COVID-19 on this project has been really significant. Uh, for the last several months, there have been very few community events despite the restrictions. Um, our community facilitators found innovative ways to reach out to community members and share important information about self-care and about boundaries and about safety, which has been very alarming numbers due to COVID-19 and the isolation and restrictions that have been put on everybody. So it has been quite hard for a lot of women. Um, so just staying connected with con consistent Facebook posts are keeping women connected to the project. Also a chance to focus on our professional development activities, including webinars. Uh, we had taken two six week courses at Cody, which included the development evaluation and uh, research methods for social impact. So see, these are some of the things we did as a group, um, the circle of support and change. Um, we also um, hit a lot of committees like the International Women's Week, the 16 days of activism, uh, take back the night, the Racial Justice Vision and Group with the Antigonish Humans Resource Center and Human Trafficking Focus Groups, which we are currently just um, learning more about um, through presentations, through webinars, and just actually doing a bit of research on how we can incorporate that learning into communities and learning more about how human trafficking is, it's everywhere. Uh, so what's next is for our project and some of the highlights this year actually being in community, we were able to kind of for, focus more on uh, the Indigenous transfer of knowledge. So me being able to do uh, medicine pouches in Canso, um, dream catchers in the African Nova Scotian community, um, journey stones also again in Canso with um, support from Andrea Curry, um, who was connected to the project also. Um, so doing the circle of support and team retreats, we actually did wellness Wednesdays during the pandemic. Um, every Wednesday, we would pick a different wellness. And this was just for staff of the Antigone Instruments Resource Center and the circle of support and change team. So it was ways for us to connect and to remind ourselves about the wellness that we did need during the isolation and how we needed to stay connected to one another. Um, it was quite difficult for all of us during this time. Um, to stay connected where we were only meeting virtually. Um, a lot of us were getting Zoomed out. Um, it was really hard, the isolation part, but being 
reconnected through uh, wellness was really helpful for all of us. And, and I was just really thankful that we had such an amazing people come together, uh, like Frank Galant, he had hosted a few uh, sessions for us as well mm-hmm. in uh, wellness, but it gave us ways to connect together. Like we did yoga, um, we did meditation. Uh, there was quite a few ways that we stayed connected, which was really helpful for all of us. Uh, so what's next for the Circle of Support and Change project is to incorporate a, an Indigenous approach through a transfer of learning and knowledge to be more culturally responsive by using healing practices for our survivors of gender-based violence through specific like workshops, events, um, like I'd mentioned, medicine pouch and dream catcher making journey stones, just some of the healing practices that we are learning together to foster and build lasting relationships in communities, helping coordinate wellness circles in each of the communities that are involved where indigenous practices are introduced and practiced or and honored, I should say. Our goal is to nurture and support all survivors of gender-based violence and sexual violence in these rural and isolated communities, drawing on the toolkit that was developed in, from the Respondent to Prevention of Sexual Violence Project uh, through website development, through in-person wellness events, uh, through support the supporters, training, education, um, relationship building and fostering the relationships that we had formed. Um, and for me to provide Indigenous support through a transfer of learning and also to understand that I am continuing to learn as I reclaim my own customs and traditions. So I just want to say thank you for Robin for allowing me to speak and um, yes, thanks. Thank you so much, Carla, for sharing about this really fascinating um, local project that started with a lo- in Bakenkek, the local indigenous yes. community and recognizing the, the strengths and assets and local knowledge and their importance in addressing such an important issue and mm-hmm. challenging reality is gender-based violence in our communities and particularly doing this work in some rural and remote communities here in Nova Scotia. It's really important. So thank that's, you so much. Yes, sure. that's for sure. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'd like to um, welcome our next speaker, Dr. Mamatha Achanta from India. Um, Mamatha is a woman and children's rights ad- activist, pro bono lawyer, and founder of Taruni, a non government organization working for the welfare of adolescent girls and women for more than two decades. Taruni stopped hundreds of child marriages and helped the girls continue their education. Taruni forms Balika Sangas and uh, Girl Child Clubs, Mamatha, I might be pronouncing that wrong and you can correct me later, in rural villages for adolescent girls and could be mentoring more than 18,000 rural girls in the, over the past two decades. Mamatha has also conceptualized Barosa, an integrated support center to access justice for child abuse and rape survivors without getting re-victimized during the legal process. Through six Barosa centers, more than 12,000 women and child victims were supported in the past five years. And Mamatha is also a graduate of the Cody International Institute and a research fellow of the Cody International Institute. So it's a delight to reconnect with her here. Mamatha, I pass the mic on to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. Very happy always to be connected to Cody. Uh, Thanks, Cody for uh, um, uh, inviting me for this uh, webinar. Uh, It's a special day today, although we are three steps backward, but we have already put the first step. Today is the 30th anniversary of the 60 days of activism. So we are celebrating, that's a great thing. Um, I would like to uh, share my screen and uh, my presentation. Yeah, so I will be speaking more about uh, uh, the Indian uh, scenario, particularly the how the girls are facing different kinds of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, gender-based violence. You all know that uh, for girls, it starts with womb 
and um, uh, it ends uh, i think uh, it is always say that for girls and women it is home to tomb so they are killed in the womb itself infanticide feticide child marriage abuse child abuse child labor so many things and they pass through dating abuse so uh, and again adolescence a uh, lot of uh, health related issues then uh, early pregnancies and again everywhere uh, they have uh, they have to face the uh, torture coercion and also in india we have dowry the other problem um, the girl has to pay for the groom and uh, so many things but uh, today i'll be speaking about only two forms of uh, abuse particularly the child marriages you all know that but uh, in south east uh, south uh, actually south asian region and also some of the african countries we have this early marriage issue and uh, i would like to start with a small story of one girl whom i met in 2011 uh, uh, this girl was only 15 years at that time and her father got her married and we came to know about the, this child marriage she was about to get to get married to a older person 45 year old and um, he he was already married uh, uh, twice and this uh, we went to stop the marriage you know it was happening in a temple and we could by the time we reached they just tied the tali that is the marriage uh, nuptial marriage uh, thread and uh, but still we rescued that girl kept her in a shelter uh, tried to give her some occasional training and um, uh, but uh, during the during a festival period after a year parents took her home and uh, uh, and uh, took her home and then the marriage got the marriage consummated although the case was in on uh, in the court and uh, uh, you know after few years i i was meeting her in the court i saw her with a baby boy and uh, she was in a very pathetic condition after many years i went to the same village where she was living and uh, she is living presently uh, she came to me and said i don't want this marriage anymore i, I didn't listen to you initially and she was in a very pathetic condition so we had to again rescue her bring her out uh, give her the livelihood uh, needed and the support needed for her 8 year old child so you can see all forms of uh, uh, violence in a child marriage this is the best case i feel for uh, such thing you know globally also we see they say that there are more than 650 million girls and women who are married in childhood and most of the women live in uh, bangladesh brazil ethiopia india and nigeria and uh, last uh, 10 years there is a uh, you know we uh, one good thing is there is a re reduction in of 15% in these child marriages now they say that out of five women or girls one is getting married and uh, there is a, they, they could stop 25 million child marriages uh, in this decade india also showed a lot of uh, improvement from 2006 it was 47 percent now in 2016 it is uh, 27 but um, uh, you know, we also had a given, given our small, uh, uh, you know, small part in this uh, uh, decrease. Taruni had stopped many marriages, uh, uh, almost 2000 uh, child marriages, uh, we could stop in two decades. Uh, we could uh, sensitize more than 8,000 officials and uh, uh, created uh, awareness materials. Uh, the five lakh villagers we have uh, sensitized through four court and puppet shows, supported the victims. Our victims are in different uh, careers now. One is doing her PhD now. Uh, so that shows that uh, we, we help the victim from end to end, giving her support for a long period of time. And we could play, we, we could get the child marriage prohibition officers in place now. And that 
it happened only through legal activism. I had filed in 2005, five a case in uh, National Human Rights Commission to stop about 60 marriages that led to a new legislation in 2006. And we were also pa uh, part of the parliamentary committee and uh, um, our suggestions were included. I, I had to do pursue my law for this and uh, we, I had filed almost 78 uh, cases in different courts till now um, on, in chi on child marriages itself. But of course, there is uh, there have been no convictions. Still, we could stop some of the marriages because uh, uh, of these uh, cases. Uh, but now, as uh, the earlier speaker said, everything changed. Everything got, uh, I think, I think it, was re it has been reverted because of COVID and a lot of uh, repercussions of COVID. Um, they say that now globally 10 million girls are at risk and 13 million additional child marriages may happen in next 10 years. And we had so many distress calls in the for the child line in India. There is 33% increase in the child marriages, uh, reports of child marriages. And in our state, where I stay, Telangana, 27% raise is there. So Taruni could stop in one block, that is 25 villages, a mandal, where we could stop about 34 child marriages just in this COVID period. So you can see how, again, everybody has gone back and our uh, it's like undoing the decades, two decades of our work. Again, child marriage is a major issue. And we have also other problems like elopements uh, where um, these girls, young girls, because they are now using the internet, uh, they have online classes and they are being lured by traffickers. They are made to become, made to become slaves, sex slaves. So everything is happening online and uh, it's becoming for us to catch hold of the child uh, couple because um, marriage, if you stop again, they're going somewhere and getting married. And government schemes, of course, there is no lack of commitment among the politicians and officials. But particularly, there is no assurance for the parents who have girls child. And uh, definitely this ad, uh, the patriarchal attitudes adds to this. So we are uh, one step forward, uh, three steps backward in this. I feel that we, uh, the girl child should have more uh, opportunities, at least till ba um, bachelor's degree, they should have free education. Uh, we have to implement the laws effectively, at least some penalties in the law, in the kind of cases. Access to health and social services, protective uh, social protection mechanism for the parents who have girls and of course Balakya Sanghas which is a proven strategy where we are trying to unify those girls and uh, um, with, by unifying them they are able to voice out stop child marriage uh, also fight for their justice so but uh, at least uh, through the new law we could bring in the mechanism we have child marriage prohibition officers from village to uh, state level so that I can just text them and say that such a marriage is happening and stop. Before I used to sit for hours together to stop the marriage and uh, uh, face all the threats. So that is the one uh, uh, best thing which happened. So this is uh, what I wanted to speak about child marriage. Uh, regarding child sexual abuse, you all, you all know it is always, there is conspiracy of uh, silence. And in India, you know, very sadly, it is called red country and now children, very young children, eight year old Katwa incident in Kashmir or six year old recently in Hyderabad who, who, were, uh, who was murdered, uh, raped and murdered by a neighbor. And even a nine month old baby was lifted and uh, raped and murdered in Warangal where we work as a field area. So it, it's also disturbing uh, cases of uh, child uh, abuse. Um, even um, if you see the number of cases, they are so high, um, you know, in the, but the government after bringing a new legislation uh, has got a new court, special courts for uh, um, these cases. 
Uh, we have about 670 courts in India and uh, almost one and a half lakh cases are pending in these courts. And they're all only child sexual abuse cases. And But the uh, annual disposal is very low. Large pendency is there. 24% uh, uh, only the annual disposal is happening in these courts. We had to do a very long struggle to get the uh, law for the uh, law on child uh, sexual abuse. Uh, it all started with 1972 Madhra case, uh, where in Gajirol in Maharashtra, where a tribal girl was um, uh, raped by uh, two policemen. And that uh, started uh, actually, that's, that initiated the amendments in rape laws. And uh, it went up to in 2012, where uh, government has brought in the new law, the Protection of Children from, from Sexual Offenses Act, POXO, we call, which is a very beautiful law, very comprehensive law. We have a mandatory reporting in that. And we also have, it's a gender neutral law, even boys are included. And even a range of sexual offenses have been defined. We have the highest punishments after Katwa in 2019 also, there, there have been amendments in this law. And uh, it talks about rehabilitation, compensation, also procedures of the court, uh, child-friendly procedures of the court. But you know what, the conviction rate is so low. It's only 2.5%. You know, after, um, uh, COVID-19, the children are locked with the abusers. Recently, uh, I got a case uh, day before yesterday where a father was, has been abusing uh, her, his elder daughter uh, and uh, he has kept, they have kept it secret and he, uh, the girl became pregnant. Then they came to know and the uh, father took her and got her aborted. Uh, mother wanted to complain, but uh, the father threatened the family. They couldn't ca ca come out, but uh, one of the neighbor complained and we could arrest the father. See, so many uh, uh, children are uh, locked with the abusers. And uh, there is a report that there is 13 percent of uh, uh, the children complaining of sexual abuse. Um, and there are there have been 43,000 cases in 2020. So one case every 12 minutes in India, and we work with police in Hyderabad. You can see the number of cases from 2017, uh, how they have been increasing, actually doubling, and uh, so many, uh, they have been doubled, and we have, we have so many cases day in, day out, every day, almost uh, in our center, four to five cases are reporting only in Hyderabad, where 60 police stations are there. So actually the law, which is very good. Everything, the structures, the codes, child-friendly codes, nothing is working. One is lack of sensitization among implementers of law, no proper infrastructure, no budgets, no uh, personnel there, delay in compensation, lack of awareness about legal processes, particularly for the parents, even outside court settlements, lot, lot of pressure and stigma on the victim families. And also, Culprits are very confident. We, when we see them in the court, they say that we can get away because they know the loopholes of the uh, law and also they have a lot of money and pull and push uh, so they can come out. So this pendency in the courts also, you know, justice is delayed. So because of that, definitely victim families uh, don't get a lot of support. So it is always, again, one step uh, forward and three steps backward. The only solution we could offer is the Bharosa Initiative, as Robin was talking um, in, in, in the introduction. Bharosa Initiative, actually, Bharosa is an integrated support center for the victims of child abuse and rape. And uh, we give them all kinds of services from end to end solutions. And we support them till the case is over and the girl gets justice. It was appreciated by Supreme Court. We could improve the conviction rate in the court where it, which is attached to Bharosa from 2.5% to 30.5%. So a lot of uh, improvement we could bring in by uh, strengthening each case and supporting each case, you know, and also the victims. Uh, we could uh, almost do uh, support 12,000 cases in these six centers, and we are planning to extend uh, to all districts. Many other states are also following this, and they are uh, also having the planning to set up these centers. 
So this is one center which gives re uh, some relief, but uh, definitely that won't help because prevention is the cure. One girl gets abused, she'll be suffering for 60 years. So we have to have proper, you know, sensitization of the people, attitudinal change, awareness campaigns. Uh, also parents have to be very, you know, alert uh, because young girls are being raped and we have to identify certain spots or the perpetrators so that we can uh, book them before. And even online abuse is very high in India. We have a lot of issues uh, because most of the children are lured now online and uh, also trafficked and used. So that is also a, a problem. A lot of follow-up is there, should be there. And we have in the law says within 90 days, judgment should come. So uh, we have to, the processes should happen in time so that uh, justice is not delayed. That's what I wanted to speak today because uh, gender-based violence is a very broad uh, you know, uh, issue and we cannot, uh, within 10 minutes, we cannot do justice, but definitely as the theme says, uh, we have to orange the world, speak out and the violence against women. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mamatan. This was more than what, what some I've seen. There are lots of comments coming in from participants as you're speaking. A lot of thank you, a lot of information shared. This was really wow. It's so comprehensive. I took notes until I didn't know at what point to end. There was so much shared and really thank you for the good work you're doing. Thank you for everything. And indeed you created a picture of uh, addressing gender-based violence, moving a step ahead and then now finding ourselves like three steps behind. Indeed, there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to continue talking and we'll be hearing and interacting with you shortly. Uh, we will now move on to listen to our third panelist. Uh, our third panelist is called Mrs. Um, she's called Miss CV Dogmo Jacqueline. Uh, she's a human rights expert and peace and security leader with over 24 years of experience and a strong passion for promoting equality and inclusion in Africa. Her background is multidisciplinary and she has implemented multiple socioeconomic development projects, targeting policy reforms, fighting against violence on women and girls, uh, assuming managerial roles both at national, African, continental, and global levels. She's currently the African Regional Representative and the Cameroon President of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILF. Since 2018, she has been coordinating several peace-oriented actions across 19 African countries. Uh, she also serves as one of the 15 African leaders on the Civil Society Regional Reference Group of the United Nations uh, in the Spotlight Initiative of the African Union. She's a member of the African Union Steering Committee for the Fund for African Women. Uh, these positions all have enabled Sylvie or Madame Sylvie Dogmo uh, to contribute meaningfully to not only to the lives of women or not only on peace and security issues in Africa, but also to be able to ensure that the rights of vulnerable groups and disadvantaged persons are recognized and respected. She has contributed uh, in the development and review of regional action plans for the Women, Peace and Security Agenda that's in Central Africa and in Cameroon more specifically. Uh, she's leading key instruments in Cameroon, uh, like the Women's Situational Room, which is an early when warning mechanism and a call center that provides a hotline and instant help or referral for victims of violence in communities. Uh, and that she's also running or leading a legal clinic that is providing appropriate, timely, or real-time support to victims of GBV. So, uh, we welcome you, uh, Ma Sylvie. 
to we welcome you into the forum and we'll be listening to you now i pass on to you the... thank you so much patience i hope you can hear me can you yes. hear me yeah because I, i'm I, I was a bit worried about the connection thank you so much permit me to start by thanking Cody so much for inviting me to share my experience and learn from the other sisters from the world about this very important topic. When I look at the, at the title of the webinar, I smile. Then at the same time, I felt sight. I smile to see that, uh, oh my God, that like smile, but at the real time, feeling some pain. Pain because we say, talk about one step forward and then three step backwards. I smile because this is the picture of the reality of GBV in Cameroon and in Africa in general. I am saying so because for two reasons. At national level, we were conducted between 2019 and 2020 a gender conflict analysis as in Cameroon to be, on the, to be able to understand the dynamics of conflict in Cameroon, the different conflicts and the role of the different actors and so on and so forth. So when I look at it, I smile because I was like, oh my God, as if they knew the reality of, of Cameroon because we were able to, 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 to see that GBV, especially regarding the security context in Cameroon is on the increase and, and is a problem. I also uh, participated recently in a workshop, in a training in Cameroon organized by Kofi Annan Peace Institute. I was the panelist. Then uh, the workshop was grounded on the, on the research that they had conducted on GBV in Africa. So it was seen that in many counties in Africa, the GBV was on the increase. Of course, with horrible impact on the, on the women. And whether in Cameroon or in Africa, we can see that uh, GBV, which is a reality, has impact at different level, at individual level, at family level, at community level, and national level. When I look at the, the physical level, the impact can be seen on women's body, physical injury, disability, and so on and so forth. But there is something that you cannot see, the psychological, the psychosocial component. Well, the gender conflict analysis made, up, made up to know that Cameroon now is in trouble. When I say in trouble, because of course we have conflict, but if you are not careful, this conflict is still to come. Another form of conflict, because there's a lot of, uh, how, how do I say it? A lot of uh, stress, a lot of stress. Women are going through a lot because of the, 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 the violence they go through. I want to cite just two cases. We went in the far north of the country and we met a young lady, a young woman who is very sick, psychologically sick. When you look at her, she's okay, but psychologically she's sick. The minute she will see a mango, which is a fruit, she will collapse because the day she was kidnapped, she was going to sell mangoes. And then she was kidnapped by the Boko Haram, and then she was given to, 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 to somebody who was called her husband. And the, and she told us that in the camp that she was being held, she would need to do have sexual uh, relation with all the men because we share husband. So these are some of the things. I want to also mention another case in Cameroon, a 25 years old lady who just died. She died just a few months, like two months ago because of, psych, of, of cyber harassment. She was harassed uh, on, on social media for something she didn't do. She was accused of um, sex tape. And she, the person who was in that sex tape came and proved the contrary. But see, she was abused by, by, by her former boyfriend and a gang. But people could not imagine the trauma this girl was going through. When she took the case to court, she was rather being accused of allowing herself and so on and so forth. But the most shocking thing is that finally she was raped. People send other people, I don't know, to rape her. But she died one morning like that because she was going through a lot. So I want to just say that this is the impact. If we look at the family, the family is completely destroyed. We have this um, divorce, we have broken families and so on. And of course, it goes to the national also with so many, uh, so many effects, like serious health problem. 
because of all this, we have a lot of serious health problems, making it that the government needs to, re to relook at their policies in terms of health. Also, the impediment, women can no more be, take, be uh, strong at players in the economic development. So this is about uh, the, the, the picture, is a slight picture of GBV in Cameroon, and then from the African perspective. But I want to talk about when I saw the question, you mentioned accountability. I want to say that the issue of accountability regarding this question that we are addressing to the gender-based violence is a very difficult and complex one when I look at the case of Cameroon. Because uh, of the political nature of the, the country, the access to, to public services or especially uh, security services is, I can say, open but closed. Open but closed because the, the people who work in those, most of them, not all of them, of course, most of them are truly influenced. They are influenced by the culture of silence. They are influenced by of the culture of naming and shaming the victims. They are influenced by the culture of stereotyping. A girl will be raped, raped, and then she'll come to the police. Then she will tell, what were you even doing there before you were raped? Yeah, we have cases like that. What were you doing? The way you were dressed was not proper. So how many women can they come again to these services when they know that there are stereotypes? about the, 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 their cases. So this is the, the, the situation. And I, I'm mentioning the, this affects, of course, the, 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 the rate or the, the, the number of cases that of women who go to these services because they are already shy, they are already afraid because they know that they will be bullied instead of being supported. But I want to say that uh, not everything is, is, is bad. In those days, um, in the past, government officials in Cameroon assigned some police officers in each commissariat, in each police station to inv investigate and follow up on cases of gender-based violence and also the proceedings. But unfortunately, it was one step forward and three steps back because now those police officers are no more. And therefore, the decision to decide, is, sorry, the decision about a case of GBV is left to individual police officers. And most of them are men. And of course, with the patriarchs, you cannot imagine. And also, some of them have not received proper training. So these are some of the, the challenge. But uh, regarding this, women in Cameroon are doing so much, all of it, civil society organization, women's group, different individual women are doing a, a lot. I want to share this one minute about uh, what we, as we in Cameroon, are doing regarding this. We do work at two level, at policy level, and then at the programmatic level. At policy level, it's more about um, advocating for uh, the adoption and implementation of law uh, against the gender-based violence and promoting women's rights. Of course, this is, has to do with policy reform. So we are trying to, to encourage to lobby and advocate in such a way that we have policy reform that take into account the issue of gender-based violence. We are also in the policy level doing research to inform our advocacy and our work. Uh, I can name two of them. We conducted in 2015 a, a baseline study which, in, which informed the National Action Plan for Security Council Resolution 1325. We, I also mentioned the gender conflict analysis. We has made that to, to provide, to support the government effort and other uh, uh, institutional effort in addressing the security uh, question in Cameroon, but also the GBV. So the gender conflict analysis has provided uh, a series of um, 10 categories of recommendation that uh, institutions, the government can look into to do proper program, pro programming. We also, um, try to build alliances because we think that we are stronger together. So that's why building alliance is some of the key, some of the, some of the things that we do because we need to do advocacy. We need to, to train or we need to talk to women in the communities. Therefore, we need to have a, a, a strong constituency to do that. That's why building alliances is some, one of the key uh, things that we do. The last thing that we do at policy level is about experience sharing at national, regional and international level. 
participating in this fora in order to learn from the others and also share our experiences. At the programmatic level, I will just name two things because of the time. We do community dialogues. The community dialogue help us to engage with stakeholders at the different at different level at the community at grassroots level. And in those communities, we also work with those people that we feel that can have an influence. Traditional leaders, for example, they are, they are a key component that we are working on. That is why we are having a project now on engaging men and boys to promote peace and fight against gender-based violence. So this is what we do in the communities. We have also patients mentioned the legal and judicial clinic. The legal and judicial clinics is there to give a support to those vulnerable women who don't have access to justice and who are, of course, justice is very expensive. They don't have access either by ignorance or by the, because of the cost. So the legal clinic is composed of lawyers uh, uh, who, are, who give support free of charge to these women. And the legal clinic is, is grounded on the, our call center with a hotline number. And the hotline gives us the opportunity to give instant help and also referral because our work is not only to work alone but to refer to cases to people who can give proper support. I'll end by giving two things and because I also saw in the question that you sent about uh, the gender-based violence, of course we do suffer as we are working on the field. It's also having an impact on our health, on our work in general. So that's why we also, as you are trying to to work with the communities, with the women, with the government and so on. We are also trying to see, look at some of the strategies to cope. What I can talk about strategies to cope is that no matter, there are so many challenges on the way and on the way of the, in the work that we are doing, but we try as much as possible to remain focused and also to look onto all those incredible women who have done so much work. When we look at them, we feel, we have the courage to continue in spite of all the difficulty. And dialogue, we make dialogue a, a priority because it's about dialoguing, dialoguing, and making sure that we break the barriers, even with those men who don't want to change and who are the, the perpetrators. And um, also, one of the things that we are started doing is really trying to incorporate self-care in our activities because we feel that the way gender-based violence is increasing, all the women's civil society organization can be greatly affected if they don't pay attention to their proper self by saying that um, it's very important for us uh, to try to be the change that we want to see. So as you are doing this work, we need to make sure that we try to be at peace with ourselves. We need to make sure that we try not to compromise ourselves in any, any way. We need to know that those women suffering, all those people uh, suffering from gender-based violence are looking up to us and we should do everything to support them. And in terms of recommendations, these are some of the recommendations, but no matter whether in Africa or in, or in Cameroon, another recommendation, other two other recommendations that I can do is to the, 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 the alliance building in country and even between countries is extremely important. And one of the weakness that we also saw regarding GBV, especially whether at national level or regional level, is that there are many actors working to fight gender-based violence, but there is, proper, there is a problem of coordination. Please, can we put an, a high priority in, in coordinating our actions? because we went to the far north of Cameroon, we were able to see the communities of internally displaced people. In some communities, some institutions have come like five times and some children end up or have like four birth certificates because when the institution will come, the family will be afraid to say, okay, let's continue again with this because they, they don't yet have the birth certificate. So they will register themselves like four times. So when ministries already have their problem solved or not. Meanwhile, in the corner, there are some IDP community who, has ne who have never received a 
an institution or a group to visit them. So proper coordination is extremely important. Coordination, referral system, you cannot do everything. You, know? you should refer to people who have expertise because, because we have different type of expertise. And then we should also communicate. We should also communicate so that these cases are known and more people join the fight. I think I'm going to stop here and be ready to answer questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvie. You have covered so much of a very complex and dynamic reality and issue affecting Cameroon, which is going through regions of Cameroon, which are going through a violent crisis and conflict right now, which exacerbates the reality of gender-based violence and sexual violence. Um, and, and also your work more broadly within across the African continent as well, making those connections that it, you know, I'm just reminded and by um, all the speakers that we have here today and the messages that I see coming through the chat, how this truly is, sadly, it truly is a, a global issue. And, you know, um, I was talking to a colleague this morning and we're, you know, um, you know, over 600 people registered for this webinar today because it's an issue that relates to them and they're working on it and they're addressing it. And many, many of those people, particularly women, you know, when they come to courses here at Cody or women's leadership courses, you know, it's a topic that comes up all the time. And I said to a colleague, you know, it's, it's great to see so many people are interested and in working in, you know, this this area because you know how many people registered for this webinar but truly in, a, in a, you know my dream would be that maybe only instead of over 600 it might be just six because this issue doesn't exist anymore and we don't need to have these webinars to to share knowledge and information across um across the world and so um but i'm delighted and encouraged and inspired by the interest um, and the work that is happening in the hope that it will change and someday, you know, the reality will be so different for everybody. So I'd like to thank all the speakers for sharing. It's just been so informative to hear about all the different actions, the realities, and also the hope and energy that people take to this work to create change for women and girls um, in your communities around the world. Oh, we just lost Sylvie. So I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, and so I'd like to begin. So we're going to shift now into questions um, and have opportunity for a discussion. I see there's been quite a few questions also posted in the Q&A. And if you have more questions for the speakers, I'd like to open. And Sylvie, you kind of got a head start on this. So um, that's great. So I'd like to pose this uh, question about accountability to our speakers. So. We know that all of you in different ways are, um, the three of you are putting in a lot of work and you work with organizations that put in a lot of work in raising awareness um, and training of decision makers, policy makers, legislators um, to create change around this with laws, policies, um, the community, family, um, and national levels. Um, and so they do this training and we know they know this. So how do we keep them account to what they've learned so that we can see that they're applying their learning into practice? So who would like to start? Mamatha, yes. Um, definitely, uh, you know, we have to, we have been sensitizing people and uh, it is part of our work and it goes on. Uh, but uh, what happens uh, when a person listens to something or or uh, learns something, it has to be uh, put it in action. So for that, people have to be questioned. So people should start questioning them. And then I think uh, these uh, uh, all the um, uh, stakeholders or the actors, they start working. Um, uh, there should be some mechanism uh, uh, of, of accountability uh, for each individual. So if it is a community person or if he's a uh, um, government official or a politician, 
everybody should have some mechanism maybe um, uh, in each his own constituency or area or uh, area of work everywhere some mechanism should be there we had one uh, chief minister in Tela, in uh, united andhra before who is to give uh, awards to the officials who has done good work in eradicating social evils or did some good work like uh, at that time you know some of the collectors got awards for stopping child marriage so some appreciation also definitely adds to it helps and encourages people to be more proactive and um, we have in police department now a culture that to uh, felicitate the police personnel who has done very good work particularly uh, in these violence cases so that also definitely is encouraging them, most of the uh, young uh, police officers to do good work. So I feel uh, these two things, making people should make them accountable, question them. Then I think some appreciation because everyone needs some appreciation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bamatha. Carla, do you have something to share? I think I saw you put your hand up before. Yep. I think it's um, really accountable to um, me, myself, as a project coordinator and the work that I am doing, um, but just to fostering all the relationships that I have and the partnerships that I had developed along the way. But um, bringing that forward um, to, you know, organizations about how to approach uh, Indigenous peoples and how they're, you know, the broken relationships between service providers and communities and how we're rebuilding that and how to gap you know bridges in the services to um, make people more accountable to their word more accountable to their actual work and what they are set out to do to help provide supports for indigenous peoples and like in our community especially um Buckingham is a is a quite diverse community and it is um lots of dynamics that you know come into play when we are in community and there's lots of um, mistrust from our community members that are reaching out to social services and you know outside services in the community where we work best with um, support the supporters or you know our supporters are our family members our you know our sisters our mothers people that we turn to that you know that are informal but are our biggest supporters and this is the best way to help educate um, service providers is to have them um, better understand um, Indigenous peoples and where we're coming from in Canada and how to approach them, you know, being culturally specific and being aware of, you know, the history for our people and for uh, Indigenous women. Um, missing and murdered is such a huge topic and I've been to countless, you know, uh, webinars and countless sessions um, with the same kind of theme where uh, we're telling our stories, you know, we're being re-victimized, we're being, you know, triggered constantly over, you know, new stories we hear in the news or, you know, new stories that are happening, you know, close to home. So just finding ways to actually um, support our women and be consistent with that support. Great, right, thank you, Carla. Sylvie. I know when you were talking, you you spoke about the importance of accountability and holding people accountable. And I, um, particularly in regards to all the sensitization, awareness raising trainings that that happen, you know, the engaging with decision makers. I'm wondering if you have something you'd like to add. Yes, maybe uh, because we have this challenge of accountability, we also try because to to to. To fight against uh, gender-based violence, we need to be together in spite of all the weaknesses. So we are looking for innovative ways of working with them to make sure that they incorporate it, uh, the mainstream gender-based violence in their, in their work. So that's why we stay closer to them by making sure that uh, all the activities, for example, that we do, we have activities with, with them. And as my sister just said, to give them the facts, to give them the data, because it's very important to to train them first to understand the degree, the devastating effect of gender-based violence. The more they understand it may be, it's going to change their mindset. I think data is also extremely important. Each time that you talk about the cases of gender-based violence in communities, 
some of these stakeholders are so touched. So it's very important to talk about the data so they will know that it's not talking in the abstract, it's talking about the facts. So it's very important. Also, uh, one of the things that I have in mind is giving them the opportunity to listen to testimonies. I remember during the gender coffee analysis, some people were saying that no, what you are saying is, is not true. But when some women, we had opportunity of some women to talk about what they witnessed, it made a whole difference. So it's very important also to make the stakeholders listen to these women who are suffering this. So it's going to really make them change and then maybe take a greater action. And also, uh, it's also important for us to give them space. We are trying to organize a space in such a way that you can have meetings, regular meetings where they come and also share with the civil society organization that we are, their, their work. We are doing that in the littoral region. So we have um, some regular uh, conversations with officers at different levels so that they just talk in your council, what are you doing regarding this? So this is, we have started doing that last year and it's, it's really very important for because People are asking them questions which are challenging them so that they are making effort to, to address that. And we, are, we continue uh, working hard to address, uh, uh, to, to make sure that the laws are implemented and also especially the fight against impunity. In Cameroon, one of the reasons why G GBV is increasing is because of the impunity. Many people, you know very well that they have raped even their children. We have a case now in Cameroon a father and a son who have raped the, 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 the father has raped her daughter with his son, two yeah, and she is dead. And he's dead. He was arrested and put into the commissariat, but a few weeks later, he's seen now in the village. How can a father and his son rape his own daughter? He's arrested and then two weeks later he's outside. So it's very important. We are we, we still continue pushing to address the issue of impunity because the minute they will see that. People are being punished, then other people will pay more attention. I will end by talking about at least a very good case that we had, very good in terms of the action. It is uh, the case of a girl who was uh, abused sexually by a renowned journalist in Cameroon with a group of other people. So, and then he took it for granted. He went on TV to say that he's a nice man and so on and so forth. But women's organization, kept the pressure, the pressure on social media at community level that the minister should not stay silent until the Minister of Women's Empowerment and Family came out with other government officials to speak of, of openly about this case. And a few days later, the boy was arrested and he is now in jail. So these are some of the things that I have in mind uh, regarding the question that you just asked me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your responses. Patience, I'm gonna pass the mic to you. Thank you all so much, our panelists. Your stories have been wonderful. And truly the, the recommendations that you've given or the contributions you've given to the, uh, the, the, the issue of accountability, I think it's uh, really well noted. And I think many people will be learning from that and applying or expanding the work that they are doing in their communities. This is really important. Now, uh, speaking to you all, our panelists, uh, we've learned about uh, the issue of accountability and we're thinking of you as activists. Uh, cope when you're pushing so hard against the government, when you're pushing so hard to see that justice is served in different ways, when you're pushing so hard to see that services are rendered to all these vulnerable groups, to all these people who are disadvantaged in one way or the other, when you're stalled in your corner, what do you do amongst yourself as an individual, uh, amongst every other actors? of peace or actors working against uh, gender-based violence. Now, what, what? how do you cope? How do you survive amongst yourselves and individually? So I don't know who wants to come first. Who would like to share? Mama Tan, thank you. Um, 
you know, our activism is not easy. <laughs> and uh, if somebody is pushed to the wall, uh, there is a saying, you know, in Telugu, <laughs> in our language, that a cat also becomes a tiger. So <laughs> we have to go, we have to fight, we have to voice out. So I had uh, many such instances. Sometimes I used to feel uh, very depressed. You know, I don't have any support. What will happen? And I had so many threats that I'm alive today. That only shows that the, ne the network or the collaborations I had and I have uh, al always helped me. You know, whenever I was stopping a child marriage or uh, helping a child abuse victim, Definitely, there will be many people who will be uh, against you. I had an instance where 300 people almost surrounded me, wanted to uh, kill me. But at the same time, my genuinity, my credibility, somehow even the God helped me. You know, some one person said, no, no, she's not at fault. You know, there is uh, the law, there is something. So we have to obey that. So somebody... There, I think God will send somebody to support us. That's how I have been, uh, uh, you know, believing and uh, it's been happening. It's all, you know, God's work, uh, what I feel. But anyway, part, uh, uh, keeping apart, keeping it apart, we have to see that every time we should have some support systems. You cannot do activism all alone. Activism cannot happen all alone. And uh, as a woman, uh, you cannot uh, uh, do it because in a system where patriarchy is so strong. So I always developed, uh, if I'm not, uh, uh, if somebody, if police, some, for example, police is not supporting, I used to go for, to the court. If the court is not supporting, I used to go to uh, government. So, so such way, we, I used to get some support from one corner, then if, if that corner is failing, then go to another car. So multiple types of strategies you should have and a lot of good network and volunteers, definitely they'll all help you. But uh, there, I think there is always hope. Uh, whenever you are pushed, you can return back just like a ball <laughs> which goes up and comes down. So that's what I've been doing. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Bamatan. Um, who wants to share next? Yes, I want yes. to. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, it's a very challenging to work uh, in this field, gender-based violence field, because you become the target. You become a target as you are trying to address this. Because you are talking about very delicate situation. When we talk about rape, we know that the, the, the perpetrators are there. And we, when you look at the case of Cameroon now with the crisis, sometimes they are from this, the, 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 the side of those who are supposed, to, are supposed to, to, to protect the women. Therefore, talking about this is very, is putting our life at risk. And personally, I've received so many threats, so many threats so many threats for years and years, like for like four years, you have received people that I want to call thief in court because they are not thief, come to our office, break the office, take away everything, computers, USB keys, hard drive for years, just to, to discourage us. But for me, I, what I've tried to do, and my colleagues as well, is to stay focused. Personally, as Sylvie, I always try to, to bring back one past story in my, in my mind the minute I'm faced to this situation to, to cope. I started this work that I'm doing today. The, one of the reasons being that I saw a woman died near me in the hospital. She was not attended for the whole night. She was ble bleeding. I was still very young at that time. And I, I, I was also very sick. She kept asking me to support her, to, to help her. I was, I would leave my sick bed to get up and go and help her. Meanwhile, we were in the, host, in the hospital and she was bleeding. She asked me, please, can you help me, my sister? I'll get, go out and then give her a toilet roll. I will see, but I was, I was like 19 years at that time. Finally, that woman died as a result of negligence. And I remember when the doctors came in the morning, she was saying, I'm going to die. And then they said, stop 
allow us to pity you. So those who were bullying her. And only a woman say, please, my, please, my, my darling, you are not going to die, please, my darling. But the others were bullying her. And she died. While they were bullying her, she died. That has never left my mind, never. Each time I think about that woman and I say, I should do everything for other women not to suffer this type of things again. So that's why I am very focused. And also, I, of course, I have started working what we did not do so much in the past, investing also in our proper security. So we are having some security training and we have one which is coming in two weeks, just to know how to handle our personal security and then our organization security including online security and physical and so on and so forth. And also uh, trying to continue the building of alliances. My sister, Akala said that you cannot work alone. We are stronger together. So we try to build alliances with other women. We try to reach out to other stakeholders, the men, the community leaders and so on, so that we work together. So building alliance is something which is also making, when we are together, I feel stronger. So I'm, the last thing that I want to say is about the self-care. Because of the damage, this work was also having in our life, in our physical life, personal, psychological. We have also started receiving some uh, psychosocial training. I personally, for one year now, I received a coaching from an international expert on how do I, as individual, as the African representative of WILF, as the president, how do I make sure that I address my the psychosocial, my own proper self-care to be able to do work in a proper manner. So I've been receiving individual coaching for the whole of last year. And for this year, it's not only me, it's the whole organization. So these are some of the things that we are trying to do uh, to, to cope. And also we reach out, we reach out to other uh, institutions, other, uh, to, to raise issues in case we have one, to also get out advice from them and see how to move forward. So these are some of the things that I can share regarding that question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvie. This is really intense. The same, the same, the same, the same, the, the same feeling coming, same as when Dr. Bamatam was talking, the threats, the frustration, the attacks, the survival, the, the support system, self-care, a lot resonating and with everything Carla had said before. And Carla, maybe before we, we, we get to listen to you, uh, we have Olga who has shared with us uh, or reference us to community toolbox that has some tactics that activists can use in the face of opposition. There are the 10 Ds. I think that will be shared with us or shared in the chat also as we carry on about the community toolkit. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Carla, over that to you. That sounds great. Yep. Uh, I just wanted to share a bit about um, in this work is boundaries and learning how to uh, set your own boundaries and understand that we need to be taking care of ourselves and our self care in the work that we do for our communities. Um, we just need to be mindful of ourselves and that when we do receive disclosures, you know, things like that, it doesn't end. Um, I've been doing this work for a few years in community and um, I seem to always get disclosures late at night. Um, so it never ends. It's just work that we constantly do. But how we uh, approach that work and how we take care of ourselves is really important and how we um, you know, we have family lives, we have children, there's so many more aspects to our life and to our ourselves than just work. But the work that we do do is so important and that um, we need to be mindful of ourselves and how we can respect our own boundaries and yeah, and practice self care in this work. Thank you so much. Carla. Thank you so much all our panelists. Thank you for sharing with us. A lot is coming up. Um, Robin, uh, I want yes. to check. Yes, I want mm -hmm. to check with you. Otherwise, uh, uh, how do we do we answer the other questions? So, so we can we can. Uh, so, I'm delighted by all the questions that have been shared in the Q and A. 
And so I think what we can do now is we can um, start to kind of address, put those questions shared in the Q&A to our panelists. So uh, the first question is, I think this, you know, kind of applies to everyone, something that we're all thinking about is, you know, how do we um, help women, girls who have been manipulated or socialized to believe that gender-based violence and sexual violence are a norm? Hi, Robin. Hi, Carla. Um, I think it'd be great to educate them on the laws and the policies and things that go around. Mm -hmm. um, these questions, yeah, I think it's really important for um, to educate youth, um, to mentor them, to understand, you know, policies and laws and, you know, to about boundaries, about healthy relationships, about consent. So trying to do this on a, a broader level for, um, you know, everybody that's learning and uh, everybody that has been affected by, you know, historical sexual abuse or, you know, gender-based violence in any way. I think it starts with our young kids and, you know, our teenagers and help mentor them to understand and navigate these systems that are here to, you know, most times help them succeed, but in most times help them fail. So I think that educating our youth and having them sitting at these tables right now would be really ideal for us to kind of um, help this issue. Thanks, Carla. Yes, if I want to say something about that, I can say that it's, 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 it's all about education. It's all about sensitization. It's all about coaching and mentoring. Yeah, because we need to, we, it's because it's, it's, it's like we are trying to work to make a change of mindset. Yeah, because of the patriarchy, patriarchal system in which these women live. So they are not saying it because they, they, they it's because they grew up thinking that that's, the, that's very okay. So that's why we feel that it's about education, it's about sensitization, it's about mentoring to help to know, that, help them to understand that it's, it's, that's, not, that's not okay, that they have their rights, they have duties, but also they have their rights because they make them feel that they have all these duties. No, we have to tell them that beside your duties as women, as girls, you also have rights. So it's about educating them, trying to let them understand, building that culture. Also, we try to build a culture of confidence so that they have confidence in themselves. The, the fact that for so long they, 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 they were left to know that they are citizens of second zone. So they feel shy in some instances. So they don't feel so bold, so confident. So it's building their self-esteem. It's also very important and to, 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 to enable to build this self-esteem and then to know, let them know that they have a role to play. It's very important. And then I think family education is also important. Family education. How do we uh, uh, educate? our young girls, our boys in the family. So it all started there. So we should make an, an effort to train women in the communities to help them to change the narrative as they are talking to their family members. So the way they are talking to girls, the way they are talking to boys. So it's all about also educating the family in order to have the impact on these girls who feel that uh, it's normal. The last thing that I want to say is uh, what I mentioned at the beginning, this project that we are con conducting, engaging men and boys. So this engaging men and boys is for us a way to challenge those negative masculinities, those ideas, preconceived ideas that people have, uh, or make women to feel that they are inferior. So working with men and boys is also a way 
because we know in the communities that we are working, the minute we work with traditional leaders, with religious leaders, when the, their narrative change, is also going to, to influence on the, those girls on the daily, because those leaders have a strong uh, power in the community. So uh, these women know that it's not the end of the world. They have also live as human beings. So I want to stop that to say that uh, our role as coaching, mentoring, and trying so that we thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Mamasa? Yeah, I agree with uh, Sylvia and uh, Carla, but the only, three th only thing I felt that there are three important actors who can change this kind of uh, attitude you know, or uh, thinking among the women. So one is parents, second is teachers, third is the faith leaders. So if these three actors don't have any patriarchal attitudes and um, uh, create a gender justice, uh, you know, environment in the in the home or outside the society. Definitely, there will be a lot of change and uh, uh, voicing out. So questioning everything that we have to, and also teach the children how to say no, even the women. So these things definitely will help. Thank you. Thank you, Mamasa. I'm appreciating all the responses that have been shared and seeing how um, the actions that are that you are discussing, you're, you're recommending, and you're using, you know, can be applied in many different contexts from in families, in schools, in communities, in government. That it that you know, there's there's so many spaces where this work can, needs to happen. Uh, one of the questions that was posted in the Q and A is, um, we've been using terms here in this webinar today, gender-based violence and sexual violence. And um, just clarifying terms, I think that's important to do. So gender-based violence is a, is a broader umbrella term and used sometimes interchangeably with sexual violence, um, where some people might say that sexual violence comes under the category of gender-based violence where gender-based violence is violent, threat of violence, actual or perceived uh, regarding one's gender. Uh, sexual violence can be defined as violence that is of a, a threat or actual violence or harm uh, of, sex, of a sexual nature. So more of, towards the uh, physical act. So that's one way of distinguishing the two. Um, and they are often used um, in different places interchangeably, uh, gender being um, more culturally um, regarded in regards to how we perceive and under identify what gender is and sexual, more of the physical um, violence towards of a sexual nature. Um, another question that has been shared is, um, you know, we've been talking very um, with many different stories, and we know that one group of women and girls who face unique challenges um, in regards to gender-based violence are women and girls who are um, have disabilities. And I'm wondering, one of the questions was asked about uh, what type of work or ideas or and and actions and concerns. Um, do you take up in your own work in regards to women and girls with disabilities when it comes to gender-based violence? Mamatha or Sylvie, I see, I see Carla has dropped off. Um, so if one of you would like to take that question. Mm. Oh, she's back. Yeah, she's back. Maybe she'll take it first, Carla. Uh, so Carla missed the question because you dropped off. Okay. So Carla, one of the a question that that we've put out there is um, women and girls with disabilities uh, face unique realities and challenges when it comes to gender based violence and how how wh what kind of special initiatives or, or actions do you are taken in your work and, and what that you're aware of. Um, particularly when it comes to women and girls with disabilities and the realities of gender-based violence. 
I'll open that up to, to everybody. Mamatha, it sounds like you were ready to respond. So why don't you go first? Yeah. See, um, when a woman or a girl has uh, some disability or uh, any uh, incapacity, definitely she becomes more vulnerable. And uh, uh, recently, uh, we had a case of uh, two uh, of twins, twin girls, uh, who are about 15 years. So one of them is having a little bit of uh, mental retardedness. So that girl was abused, and the other girl was paid. So you can see, and that was also an incest abuse. So father was abusing the other girl because she's she cannot voice it out, she cannot talk it out. So definitely these uh, women who have this kind of, uh, um, who are differently able to will have a lot of uh, um, issues of uh, vulnerabilities and uh, they have to be protected. Uh, but uh, very sadly, um, we have uh, uh, a number of uh, policies, laws, even so many things for the women uh, but I see that everywhere uh, such uh, differently abled women suffer a lot, even for education, for uh, getting their rights, uh, they suffer a lot because of the lack of infrastructure, because lack of protection, lack of uh, everything, you know, support from the family. So, uh, and uh, uh, even the, after some time, even the family won't be there for them. So in, when the, the childhood the family may be supporting, but later nobody supports. So they become more vulnerable to violence. And most of the time, if you see the uh, data, definitely the differently abled women only get uh, abused. So I think uh, it become it should be a it should be our responsibility who are all having uh, you know all the limbs and uh, every uh, body parts. So we should feel uh, more responsible towards uh, such women and girls and uh, support them. That is important, not uh, anything else. And that responsibility should uh, be taught from childhood to the children uh, in the families. And the families should support uh, the such women and girls in the communities. So that is uh, uh, what I think uh, will help. Thank you. Thank you, my mother. Sylvie or Carla, do you have uh, something you'd like to add? Yes, maybe just two, just two things. The first we, is uh, all the the. The, the research that I've mentioned earlier, we try to uh, to bring out the dynamics of this uh, specific group so that the stakeholders understand that these are people with special needs. So we bring out this in our different reports and we bring out recommendation accordingly. Also in our work, we, we don't work specially with, uh, with um, these categories people, but we work with organization working on them because they are organizations in Cameroon working with this. So what we do we, is about like what we, we indicate each time that we have an issue, we make sure that we document the, the different cases and then we put them in touch with the organizations working with them. So we it's, it's, it's about alliance building with the organization working on this category of people and also bringing out their issues so that the institutions, the government officials, different stakeholders know what actions to take. When we are doing work in the communities, for example, uh, like humanitarian, that's what we are doing in the humanitarian, what we do is that we take care of these uh, people, knowing, taking, we take care of their uh, specificities in terms of uh, access, in terms of time management and so on. So these are some of the small things that we do, but it's mainly about uh, advocacy in such a way that they are, they are given priorities in the policies generally, because it's all about policies. Uh, if there are policies, uh, relevant policies implemented, I think that is a good thing. So that's what I wanted to add, thank you. Thank you, Carla. 
Could you repeat the question? Sorry, I my phone died. That's okay. Uh, the question is, what type of um, initiatives or um, awareness um, activities um, do you are you aware of, or are you engaged in with your work and with the communities when it comes to gender-based violence and girls and women with disabilities? Some of the work that we do now in our community, um, the advocacy work um, is around racial justice. Actually, we just started a group at the uh, Women's Center here and we do meet, well, we have been meeting uh, monthly and twice a month and just bringing some really hard issues to, you know, to face that, you know, we, we as women of color um, deal with these issues in many institutions and in many organizations, but it comes in many different forms. But how we react to that and how we respond to that, you know, it shows a lot about our work ethic and how we, you know, we plan to move forward regardless, you know, of these limitations that are put in place for us, you know, and systems that are put in place for us. Um, not to fail, but to um, not have our voice heard and not being at the table and not being at the right tables, for instance. Um, so just having that voice as an Indigenous woman and being you know, working outside of our community, it isn't easy, um, you know, going back into our community because there are so many complex is issues already in our community that, you know, we're not dealing with head on, you know, things like mental health and addictions, you know, there's so many um, survivors and victims um, of gender based violence and sexual violence in our community and it's so small, you know, we're a population of almost 400 people in community. And you know, most people aren't accessing the services and supports that you know that are put in place for them to utilize within community. You know, just as this has a lot to do with trust, it has a lot to do with barriers, it has a lot to do with boundaries, it has a lot to do with relationship building. And this is something that we really need to focus on and be really true to um, when working in community, um, being accountable for you know our work and putting. Uh, or sharing the voices of all the women that are in community who aren't able to share, who wait sitting at the table that have so many concerns and issues that they bring, you know, to me like a community member and, you know, to learn more to support them and how to navigate these systems that, you know, that are really hard for some women to do. Um, I think it's a really, really starts with organizations staying true to their policies, you know, and their procedures on how to respond to people and women of color. Thank you, Carla. Patience, did you wanna ask one of the questions in the Q&A? The, the, thank you, uh, Robin. In line with the, the question about uh, special groups, there's also another question that is uh, specific to the situation of LGBTQ, like uh, whether there are other forms of violence related to this that we might want to speak about them in our work. So I don't know, uh, other marginalized groups, because we've talked of persons with disabilities, but there's this other group of persons whose, uh, whose sexual orientation is different. I don't know who might would like to answer that question. Uh, this is Carla. I'm just going to say that okay. I think that uh, supporting all people um, no matter their statue or what their preferences is supporting them and giving them the proper resources and tools that they need to proceed in their lives and their, you know, their workforce and their family and their personal lives. But 110% is to support them in their learning, in their understanding and in sharing all this with community. Um, we did start an LGBTQ plus group in the community a couple of years back, which hadn't gone very far but the issues were really forward and, you know, the people had to understand that there are complex issues for people that are um, dealing with these type of issues daily. 
Thank you, Carla. Um, indeed. Uh, we have another very sensitive question that was asked on the issue of incest. Incest uh, was discussed by uh, Sylvie when she was talking about cases in Cameroon. And uh, well, there's a question to know how incest is addressed, especially when the laws favor the male gender. So I don't know who would want to speak to that. Thank yes, you, maybe Mama. I want to. Okay. Sylvie wants to speak. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, see, whenever there is uh, incest, reporting is very low. Uh, the family wants to protect, and uh, if the person who is doing it uh, is uh, is heading the family or is the breadwinner of the family definitely um, the women never want to report it and the family other members also never support it uh, uh, that is one thing and uh, the loss loss are common for everyone but uh, because of uh, 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 low reporting and secondly because uh, of uh, you know uh, not supporting the legal processes uh, the, the case will uh, uh, the, the punishments will never uh, happen that is the one uh, uh, problem. Um, uh, and uh, because the witnesses or the evidences are from the same family, uh, so definitely uh, we can't uh, expect that they will go opposite to the uh, perpetrator. That is one thing. And the second thing is uh, uh, they are always snapped. They are always not uh, you know, encouraged to talk about these things. And um, uh, that is uh, most uh, that is uh, very normal in most of the families, uh, and people think that is uh, the children also think or the youngsters think that is it is uh, normal. If a husband beats a wife, it is uh, considered as normal. And most of the children in India, there is a survey that fifty six percent children feel that it is very quite normal for my father to beat my mother. Similarly, incest is also looked at as very common. So very rarely uh, people come out and talk about it. I feel 80 to 90 percent of women face that, but they don't talk about it. We have to have a uh, lot of support and uh, the support systems, you know, for the, because the girl or the woman will lose the family if she reports it. So she has to have such a strong support system to come out and fight for justice. So we have to create all those support systems for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mamatan. Uh, uh, I think Sylvie wanted to talk. Yes, just to, to add to, I, I want to say that in, in the case of Cameroon, this is, these are cases that are underreported. They're underreported because uh, of the, not only the, the issues, but the family context uh, make in such a way that the victims have uh, don't have the, the, the possibility or are scared to to, to 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 talk about that because they are threatened so much. So now, what is uh, uh, important now is to to report on this type of cases and then to what we women are doing for the few cases that I, I know in Cameroon, women mobilize to draw the attention to make. Uh, the, 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 the legal aspect or the, the administration to take action because most of the time they also look at what they call amicable solutions. So all, all the time they will say no because you are in a family, it's not, a very, it's not, important, it's not good that uh, people know that you are divided in our family. Sometimes some money will be paid for the other part to keep quiet. So what is being done and what is important is that first, these cases uh, are reported and also uh, that actors keep mobilizing and indicating that it's very important to, to, to address that and to make sure that we, we bring other people to speak out because truly these are cases which are underreported. 
but there are many cases. Now more and more people are bringing out some of these cases because they have seen other people talking about it. So we should encourage uh, people to talk about that. We should also um, try and report so that they are known, the minute they are known around it. And the case I mentioned that uh, I witnessed was the mobilization of women who went to court the day one uh, of these uh, perpetrator was about to, to be judged. So the women wore a t-shirt. On the t-shirt, they were saying no to fathers of something like that, just to draw the, the attention. That was the first time I was see it. So to talk about it and encourage others to the mothers, because also, let me permit me, also the women, of the wives of these perpetrators sometimes protect their husband when they know that the husband is either having a relationship with their own daughter in the name of marriage, because if she goes out of the marriage, she will not have access to, 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 to basic needs. So one of the things that is very important is the social and economic empowerment of women uh, and, and also the, of women in such a way that they'll be at least free from dependence and then they will be ready to talk without fear of so much reprisal from their spouses. Thank you so much, Seve. Um, uh, Robin, I, I'll pass on to you to conclude with the rest of the questions, please. Sure, okay. Um, I wanna thank you all for this very engaging discussion and, and the questions that you have posed. Um, we're we're kind of counting down to, to, to towards the end here. So um, we've gotten to a lot of the questions that were posed. Fortunately, we haven't gotten to any. I feel like, you know, we could continue answering questions and engaging in these questions on this important topic for much longer. Um, I'm just so thankful to all of you for, for coming here and joining us today. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available at a later date on the Cody, Cody International Institute's YouTube channel. Um, I wanna put one last question to, to the panelists and um, focusing on building our peace ability, our abilities to build peace in this world. And the question is, so, um, Ending gender-based violence and building a more just, equitable, and peaceful society is a collective action that requires individuals to take action. So what is one thing that you think we, who are part of this webinar today or watching this webinar, can do or start to do to end gender-based violence? Go ahead, Carla. Uh, I think it would be to not normalize uh, sexualized violence in, in any form, in any community, in any organization. Um, sexualized violence is so normalized in First Nations communities um, where we need to recognize um, and share and educate on, you know, these type of topics and to better support the victims and survivors of sexual violence and gender-based violence. Um, yeah, I think it's a really complex issue and especially for an Indigenous woman and a survivor myself. Um, I do, you know, acknowledge that I am a survivor of gender-based violence and sexual violence and I do share that with community members and people in my community, people I work with, just to have a better understanding of myself and how and why I do this work and why it isn't so important to acknowledge that I am a survivor and to give others that voice to be a survivor and to say it as well. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Carla. Um, unfortunately, Sylvie had to had to step away to, to go to another meeting. I'm very grateful for her participation in this webinar today. Uh, Mamatha, I'm gonna turn to you now. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with Carla, but uh, at the same time, I think uh, it's high time the women get united uh, because uh, unity is power. Definitely unifying the women and girls will uh, help in supporting the victims and also in um, voicing out and uh, getting the uh, required uh, the due justice. Um, I heard one victim of trafficking say in one of her meetings, she said, help us build our self-esteem. Never let us forget that we are all beautiful. 
teach us our value and worth. So I feel uh, uh, that is what is needed for all the victims. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mamatha. And thank you to everyone. Before I, before I hand the mic to patients to do the, the final closing, I just want to also let people know who are here today or watching, um, watching this, this webinar that here at the International Center for Women's Leadership at the Cody, we're pleased to um, let people know that we have two courses uh, open for applications right now. So one of them, the first one starts in January, and that is the Advancing uh, women's peace building leadership for community development that's going to be uh, that's designed and co facilitated by patients and myself. So um, we're very excited to to dive into that and this this topic around gender based violence will of course come up in that course. Um, as well, we have uh, here at the Cody starting, um, I believe it's in March is the women's leadership and community development course and both these courses are available online. And they're they're for women. So in you know building on Mamatha's um, emphasis on unifying women, you know uh, women's only spaces and spaces for women to come together and talk with other women from around the world on the issues that are relevant to us is really important. We do also recognize that this work is involves everybody. And um, if you're interested in learning more about how to engage male youth in gender based uh, in addressing and building gender equality, I'm going to suggest that you check out on the Cody YouTube channel the webinar we did last year during the 16 days of action on engaging male youth in gender equality. Um, so thank you everyone for joining patients I'm handing the mic over to you. Thank you so, so much Robin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Carla. Thank you, Dr. Mamatan. Thank you for everyone. All uh, thank you to Sylvie who has just led, and to you all, uh, everyone who has participated in the webinar. We're so grateful for the contributions, for the comments, for the questions, uh, and for all we could answer, and more that we could have answered and that we we could not because of time. And like Robin has already said. There's also uh, more spaces for such discussion in the courses that uh, Cody, uh, the Cody Institute or the Women's Leadership Center offers. Uh, thank you all so much. And we finally come to the end of our very brief webinar. And a big thank you to all and we wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Um, well, this is it. I think we've made it <laughs> one step forward and three steps back, we keep thinking, someone wrote in the chat that there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of actions. There's a lot of actors. So we will keep doing in our different corners, both for our panelists and for the participants who were not able to showcase their work. A lot of people wrote in the chat about the work they're doing. A lot of people shared resources, uh, they shared links, and we really do recognize all of that. Thank you so much for we'll continue sharing uh, through the platforms that Cody is offering us and through other platforms. And uh, we wish you all the best. And very special thank you to Jenny and, uh, Jenny and Brian, Brian from for the, the wonderful work they have been doing behind the scene. They have been coordinating all of this for us, coordinating the the moderators coordinating with the panelists and everyone. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. We wish you all a wonderful evening and day, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Patience. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Cody. Yes. Nice meeting you, Carla and uh, Sylvia. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day and keep up the good work the important work that you're doing and um, and and remembering and acting during these coming 16 days of activism. <laughs>